Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the environmental webinar, New Perspectives on Horizontal Wells for Assessment and Remediation. I am Tamel Harbison with the SAME National Office, and I will be assisting with any technical issues you might experience. Before we get started, I would like to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, you have entered into the presentation in a muted form, but we ask that you double check your mics to see if you are muted. Any questions that you have throughout the presentation, we ask that you ask them in the Q&A tab, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. You are able to down today's presentation in the handout section, as well as the PDH certificate. This webinar is recorded, and you will be able to view at a later date on the COI webpage. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jane Huber, our moderator. Thank you, Tamal. Uh, and welcome to the webinar. I'm trying to undo my thing there. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to introduce our speakers today. First one is uh, Steve Konisberg, and I should have asked how to pronounce your name. Um, and uh, his youngest daughter, Clarissa, turns 18 today. Um, and so it's a big day for him. He's uh, apparently he's he's also emancipated from any kind of parental control. That's neat. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah. And then um, let me see. We'll move on to the next one. Is okay. Is Lance Robinson? Uh, Lance has four boys and is waiting for a baby girl to arrive in late March. Um, does a lot of uh, coaching of baseball and soccer and also loves outdoor sports, fishing and boating and golf. Uh, his favorite activity is skiing, but he lives in Florida, so that's hard to do. Um, farthest he's been from home is uh, a mission trip to Cambodia. Thanks, Lance. And then our... Uh, Last speaker is Timothy Havernack. Again, I should have asked how to pronounce that, sorry. Um, Tim's an avid road cyclist and averages uh, 3,500 miles per year, that's great. Conducts his own studies in polyhedral geometry and geometric design. He's our numbers person on the call and he is a trained classical guitarist. So welcome and I will let you guys take it away with the presentation, thanks. Oh, well, uh, this is Steve Konigsberg, and uh, that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to open up with a minute to uh, acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, Tim Habernack uh, is somebody we work closely with who helped us build a, a model we call the horizontal to vir virtual ra uh, vertical ratio model um, that he will speak to for a per short period of time. And, uh, and Lance is our CTO who uh, designs, builds, and installs the wells. Also, a quick note, I was told it would be good to mention, we are a, a service uh, disabled veteran-owned small business. Our CEO is Eric Pyatt, who's a veteran of uh, Desert Storm. He was in the Marines, uh, and he's healthy in everything right now, so that's, that's good news, and uh, uh, he's our leader. Um, and so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Lance to go through the presentation. I'll be back on for an ESTCP intro because we are involved in a, uh, a program with them right now. All right, thanks, Steve. So uh, we wanted to uh, discuss vertebrae well systems. Uh, it's a nested well that, uh, that's bringing a lot of advances to the, uh, the field. And, but first we wanted to cover a couple things about horizontal wells in, in general uh, as we jump into this. And those are a couple advantages we see, uh, two big ones. The first of which is we can drill from really any direction, uh, 360 degrees. Instead of having to be vertically on top of our problem, we, we now have this ability to, to do this from any direction. And this helps out tremendously with different um, different obstacles we face. The first of which is a lot of the utilities. Every site has quite a few underground utilities we can't see as well as some over, overhead utilities. Uh, secondly, the buildings, the roadways, things like that, things that we've built uh, that are large structures that get in the way, but also just, you know, some, some more naturalistic environments, uh, roads, or uh, sorry, rivers, streams, uh, but even sometimes just trees and, 
and some forestation that we don't want to have to tear down to install our system. So we can now go under all that. Uh, one of the biggest features though is what our clients see. Uh, there's really three components to what the clients benefit from. The first of which is business disruption. If we can not impede traffic and not block entrances and exits, we can uh, help them out significantly. Uh, but also the stigma of having a, a vertical drill rig on site uh, it seems much worse than a horizontal rig, which can be off to the side or even out back. And I'll, I'll show you that. And lastly, site security. We see this as a, a big benefit as sites uh, require more and more that we don't go into certain buildings we don't have access to. We can now drill under them and get information and install our horizontal wells. The second major component to horizontal systems is they have a better layout and geometry. Uh, they're concurrent with the, the plume. So these plumes are usually thin and longer than they are deep or thick. And so this yields itself to, to a horizontal installation. Uh, secondly, that's also orthogonal to the bedding. So we're in a, we're in a similar unit the whole time and that's, that's an advantage as well. And Tim's gonna get into a lot more of that as we uh, get further into the presentation with our um, horizontal to vertical model that we've built. And then lastly, it's more efficient when we're drilling through less overburden. The, the deeper the problem is, the more overburden we may drill through. But if you had, you know, 10 vertical wells, you'd be drilling through that overburden 10 times, whereas a horizontal well may only have to drill through it twice. And so that's, that's the main horizontal, dis, or horizontal advantages. But there is a challenge. Uh, we could even call it a disadvantage, but I'll show you how we've overcome it. Uh, the challenge is that most of the soils are so um, heterogeneous, uh, even in units that seem like they're all sand or they're all a sandy silt or something like that. They have all these different layers for which flow changes. So high, high K or low K zones uh, can create quite a bit of issues. So for instance, you take this graphic, uh, a long continuous well uh, would uh, have a lot of preferential pathways and even if they install this well using some type of method where all the reagent or all the air comes out in one or in a nice uniform uh, consistency down the length of the well, it's still installed in a borehole, which has you know created its own preferential pathway. And so you're going to have these uh, problems with with the flow, and the more uh, those that flow exists, the more it opens up and continues to channel. And so they actually progressively get worse. And so that's where we came along. Uh, we said, how can we address this? How can we tackle this challenge? And uh, the answer was, uh, well, why don't we try nesting the wells horizontally? And so that's what we built. We built a well screen with a riser and a grout zone, and then another one, the same, uh, same makeup, a well screen riser, another grout zone, so on and so forth. Just like you'd have in a typical nested well situation, we're just installing them horizontally. So there's some tricks to, to being able to do that, uh, but it gives us a lot of independent control and that yields, uh, yields control over that same uh, type of zone. So if we go back to that graphic, we see uh, that we now have three times as much control as we previously had. And we like to point out that's not perfect. Uh, in a perfect world, we'd have infinite amount of control, right? Uh, but this is certainly three times better than one and you know most of the time we're installing five ten fifteen wells so we we're exhibiting a lot of control through these zones it's instantaneous the the feedback we see as soon as we start developing them uh, we see these zones certain wells will clear up faster than others when we're developing them as soon as we start injecting we see higher pressures or lower pressures or more flow in, in typical units and it doesn't stop there we when we sample them we see that you know maybe we thought you know, the contamination was in one spot and it was really in another spot. And so we we may have originally thought we wanted to treat the more permeable zone, but find out that we really have to focus on, for instance, this green well instead of the red well. And so uh, it gives us a lot of that control. So let me show you how that works out. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple investigation studies and a couple remediation studies uh, to illustrate this point. So here's the first case study. Uh, this was actually one of our original case studies, uh, one of the first ones where we saw all these benefits. Our background 
was injection and we were trying to perform better injection using horizontal wells and try to get that control. And so that's when this one came along and it was an industrial complex built in the seventies. And so you can imagine they had kind of tighter hallways and, and lower ceilings uh, than what they're doing nowadays. And to make matters worse, it was a wood shop and there were, you know, dozens and dozens of, of very heavy uh, type of equipment, woodworking equipment. And so you really couldn't get inside. So the best they could do was outside of the building, they had done their assessment and in one overhead door location, they'd been able to pull a rig in and get a, get a sampling location, but it was largely unexplored inside. And so this is, you know, a very typical situation where they're, um, they've gotten as much as they can get and they want to move forward and start addressing the problem. And so they install a remedial system. They chose to do vertebrae to go under underneath that building again, because any interior vertical um, placement of remedial wells would have been nearly impossible. And so what they did was four vertebrae well systems, each with six to eight uh, well segments. And those yielded uh, kind of an eye-opening scenario. So we saw four times as much contamination in that zone. And then in addition to that, we were able to pinpoint the floor drain that was the culprit of the problem. That's, that's how precise we were able to be with our wells. And really uh, the, the spacing on them was about 20 foot center. So we could find out a lot of information from, from beneath the building without actually drilling through the floor. Now we see that as a typical problem and then we're able to really hone in on where the source resides and then we're able to do some type of surgical remediation. So the second part of this gets into a couple remediation case studies. We're able to do everything your typical wells uh, can do as far as remediation. So we've got some out there for uh, pump and treat, if you wanna go uh, to kind of older technology, all the way up through SVE, vapor intrusion sites, um, ozone, air sparging, a lot of different uh, varieties there. And of course, injection, and even reductive type of uh, amendments that are added to the subsurface as well as biosubstrates. So really everything that, that uh, typical wells are used for. The main thing that we see though, is that the segmentation really gives us an additional, additional advantage over just controlling the preferential pathways. It gives us the ability to adapt to the plume dynamics like a vertical layout. So let me show you how that uh, plays out in a case study. So this is a uh, you know fairly typical small plume, uh, 250 to 300 foot long, and it was um, in a homogeneous material that we take that with a grain of salt. But the uh, the owner had three adjacent properties uh, to contend with as far as they didn't want wells on their property, they didn't want vaults on their property, and so he had to go vertical or he had to go horizontal from the very beginning of the project. And a conventional horizontal well could have done what we initially did, which is we're going to blanket this plume uh, with the 26 vertebrae well segments. And so a horizontal well we could imagine could do that. Uh, but then that's where things change, right? So as we're treating the wells, we're, we're or treating the plume, we're expecting it to respond. And we never know exactly how it's going to respond. And this was the, certainly the case at this site. Um, the second after the second quarter, we realized from sampling that there was a recalcitrant area toward the back. Now, um, with vertebrae, it's it's pretty easy to just focus on the area, just change out some of the riser hookups, uh, basically connect to different plumbing and start treating the back of the plume. But uh, obviously with a singular horizontal well, that's very difficult to do. And that's really where this technology separates itself from uh, those older, uh, traditional horizontal remediation wells. That strategy continued for the very last quarter. Uh, we cleaned this up in four quarters and we were able to surgically target one well uh, during the last quarter. So it really puts the engineer back in control of the treatment the whole time. And it makes it more efficient uh, from the standpoint of whether it's injection or whether it's air sparging, we're able to uh, be smart about how we apply it. Here's another case study, very similar. And this one kind of shows how, um, how useful it is to drill in different locations. 
Uh, so you can see we're uh, quite a distance from the plume. And um, the, this was in Colorado. The, the two roadways there are both state owned. And so they, we just weren't allowed to drill any vertical or do any trenching in those locations. And so that was certain to put us into this horizontal category. Uh, what was nice though, is the owner was also uh, taking advantage of all these benefits, right? So uh, we were able to drill from out back and drill underneath his building uh, and underneath the canopy, underneath the tank uh, that's on the lower side of the property, underneath all his entrances and exits without causing any kind of business disruption. And so it was uh, very nice to be able to place his system way back at the back of the store, but also nice to stay out of his way. Uh, that was uh, an obvious benefit. What was interesting about this project was the results. So um, this was the baseline. Within one quarter, uh, we had reduced that El Napple uh, on the previous slide was actually El Napple plume. And then uh, three months later, it was reduced in a large degree. And they were able to, again, focus in on the wells that mattered simply by turning off ones they didn't need anymore. And uh, reduce this to clean up standards within six months. And we attribute that to the two factors, the horizontal nature, which is uh, more efficient and uh, can provide more treatment because it's in a horizontal plane, but also to the ability to adjust and, and compensate as the plume changes and evolves. Here's um, a cross section of that installation. You can see the air sparge wells down at uh, 30 foot in this case in the SVE wells at 15 feet and the spacing on them is different. It's all custom designed. There's custom links, uh, custom tubing sizes. So we pick all of that depending upon how uh, the client wants to uh, clean the site up. So I'll spend a little bit of time discussing system installation. The, uh, the installation process usually uh, has a lot of detail in it and we you know, sometimes can take almost an hour to cover it. So this is kind of the brief overview, uh, but uh, it'll hopefully give you a lot of detail here. The first of which is we pre-manufacture the wells. So they're pre-manufactured and put into a sleeve. That's shown on the left side of the screen. It's spooled up on a, um, a portable uh, spool that can be brought to the site. And so it can kind of stay out of the way. And then it's pulled into the ground with the drill, ro the drill rod. So you can see it there on the left, the drill rod string sticking out of the ground and they're going to attach to that and start pulling it into the ground. And that's what you see on the right side, uh, the, the conduit or sleeve as we call it being pulled into the ground. The drilling is, uh, is steerable drilling and to steer it, they have to locate it. So there's really two ways to locate. One is called walkover where they have these devices uh, where they're just walking over the drill bit wherever it is and uh, locating it with radio frequency. The other technique uh, uses a, produces a magnetic field and then they can locate things where they don't have to walk over. That's obviously more useful if you're going under a building you don't have access to, uh, but also has an additional accompanied cost because it requires more tools to do that. The steerable bits look like this. Uh, one of these is more of a rock bit. Uh, the one on the left is more of a sand, silt, and clay bit. And basically they steer it by knowing the uh, clock position of the drill head and uh, by pushing forward or drilling forward at certain angles. And they're able to steer up and down, left and right, and uh, be able to place things precisely where they want. Uh, on the previous slide, it showed uh, about an inch or a tenth of a foot is the typical ac accuracy. It's actually one to 5% per foot of depth. So. If you're trying to drill down 100 feet, you'll have a little less accuracy, uh, but of course at 100 feet, uh, that's expected. And so all of that said, that's kind of the part of the installation. Uh, another big part of the installation is how we've reduced costs. So um, when people hear about horizontal wells, their first thought is it's really expensive. And we realized that at the very beginning as well, but we created a device, a device that's more efficient and so what we were trying to do with it was figure out, well, how do we make it more applicable to more sites? And so it was a little bit smaller. And the first thing we realized is that smaller rigs have huge advantages. And um, those are mainly because the rods they use 
uh, are smaller and so they can turn quicker and dive uh, better and even exit much, much faster. And so that's less drilling. But we also like small rigs because they have smaller footprints, but they, they produce less IDW. Usually there's less uh, personnel to accompany them. And so they can be operated with less, uh, less labor expense. And even when we get to dead end bores, bores that don't exit the ground, uh, they are less expensive as well there. And so that was part of the key to, uh, to bringing the cost down was, was utilizing smaller equipment. That's not to say that we can't use larger equipment for longer bores, uh, depending upon the, the length, but we generally try to size that appropriately and find the right rig for the job so that we're not uh, spending more money than we have to. Uh, the major, the second major component to that is by using local rigs and smaller rigs and, and different types of rigs, we're able to find local experts. Uh, this cuts down on our mobilization, which is a huge cost in a lot of these projects. And we're able to, you know, even mobilize the sites for very small wells, for very small jobs and keep the cost effective. Uh, it also helps us though, those local experts actually understand the local lithology and the tills better and so they don't have a learning curve of getting used to that uh, particular soil type on site. So we'll team up with them, we'll send our own expert as far as installing the wells and then allow the local experts to help us uh, and you know, get them in the ground correctly. And then lastly, there's some, in, uh, there's some cost savings on the back end of this when you realize that the wells are more efficient and we cut down the, the time scale of the, the total project. And so that's always a benefit. So I'm gonna step you th through uh, two different graphics or series of graphics to kind of show you how this is installed. And so um, this uh, is just um, kind of you, if you can envision this. So we'll drill into uh, the ground and we'll come out the other side and then we'll pull our sleeve back. And again, the well is already inside there. And then once we get to the other side, we'll anchor one end of the well system, the wells coming out of the ground, we'll anchor those well heads and then we'll start pulling the sleeve off. Now we might do this simultaneously with placing the grout, although a lot of times we'll wait until the well system's completely in and we'll grout it using trimmy, uh, trimmy pipes to, to place all the grout at the correct zones. And then uh, a dead end bore or a blind bore doesn't exit. So it's going to trip in and then trip back out. And then Typically, we've got to ream that hole a little bit bigger. So we'll stick in a reaming bit and ream back out. And then we'll have to push our product in. So you can already see that this is more drilling because we've been in and out of this hole three times. Uh, and so the cost is usually more expensive for the uh, compared to just exiting. Uh, we deploy an anchor. The, the head of the well sleeve is an anchor and it gets deployed. And then we're able to pull that sleeve back off as we did before leaving our wells in place. Of course, you see three here, but usually it's much more than three wells in our well system. And so that brings us kind of to a comparison slide, really a, a little bit of a summary here. Uh, we see that these can help us in uh, access areas uh, where it's uh, difficult or impossible to gain access to the subsurface. We can approach it from a different angle. Uh, horizontal wells also do that. but Horizontal wells don't help us go from horizontal or from assessment to remediation like the nested or the nested horizontal wells. And so that's the, the advantage there as well as filling in data gaps from assessment. And then I didn't mention this, but they are a repeatable uh, tool because they are permanent. So when we sample them, we can sample them over and over again and get more information. And so that's actually leads us into um, a high res type of tool situation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the fifth thing here is really kind of the critical thing that I guess the most important thing from a, a remedial standpoint is how we can adapt to the plume and be much more efficient than conventional horizontal remediation wells. Um, also, there's an easy transition from assessment back to remediation. We have sites where uh, some folks have wells where they've, they've done a treatment, they've resampled, they've done another treatment, resampled. We have uh, some sites where they will reserve certain wells just for sampling. So the third well, the sixth well, the ninth well are all, all strictly for sampling. And then they use all the others for some type of treatment. 
Uh, you would think there may be some bias in that well, but we've shown actually that that does not occur in some of those case studies at all. And so the grout seals are really competent and prove that. And then uh, the last two bullets, this is a very well uh, suited product for going down the length of the plume. Uh, that's why we called it vertebrae. But we see more and more people actually installing it for transects or, or curtains or different things like that. Uh, especially if the plume's wider, we don't have to go down the middle of the plume. Uh, that's just typically the more efficient way is to, to take the longest length that you can go. And then lastly, it's a high value product when you, when you tie all that stuff together, being able to sample it, being able to install it cost effectively, being able to be more efficient with how you uh, implement your remediation, it's a very high value target or high value product uh, for its overall cost. There's other considerations. We're doing more stuff with um, high resolution site characterization. Now we actually call it something different, uh, high resolution contaminant distribution. And we call it that because it resides in a different plane than all the other high res tools. So it's the only tool of its kind producing additional granularity in a horizontal direction. It's actually more granularity than typical well layouts. And so that's one thing about the ISO contours it produces, they're much uh, higher in resolution there, uh, but even sometimes even higher resolution than some of the soil layouts. And it's a very customizable space. Uh, once you're drilling that borehole, it's uh, cost effective to, to increase the density there because you've already mobilized the rig, you're, you're already drilling the bore. Uh, the density um, of data collection or even treatment collection is a matter of, you know, how much will fit in that bore. And then that kind of gives us the economics for being cost effective, but gaining a lot of information or having a very discrete treatment layout. Uh, we're also using them for um, uh, PRBs, permeable reactive barriers. So uh, there's some of that up and coming. And with that, I want to transition just a little bit and let Steve talk to you about one of our um, um, ESTCP projects. And I'll hand over the mic there, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Lance. I'm just going to take a minute or two. Actually, I want to back up in terms of uh, my introduction. I want to thank Phil Rosenberg, who many of you may know uh, is very active in the San Diego chapter, and um, and Rick Weiss, who uh, I'm privileged to be working with on the Battelle conference on the steering committee. He's uh, with another colleague. He's putting that huge and very important meeting together. Um, so uh, with those acknowledgements, I'll also uh, uh, share with you a little bit about how we got to this point. We are privileged to be part of the ESTCP uh, program. We got the award last year. Uh, we were brought into it by Craig Devine, who's one of the senior geologists at Arcadis and a, uh, someone I've worked with in the past. He's won multiple awards, and you can see there's a little picture in the lower left that is his HRX well system that he's been very successful with at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. All you got to do is look that up on the uh, BSTP website, just punch in Divine, and you can see all of his work. Of course, people like Beth Parker have joined forces with uh, uh, John Cherry, who uh, needs no introduction. As, the hydro, as one of the hydrogeology uh, founding fathers. And uh, so they are also in this process doing a lot with uh, the things that Lance will go through. We've asked them for a few of their slides. And there's uh, Lance, as you can see, and we have another teammate. Um, we have a, a couple of very senior PGs in the company. Uh, one is Wes Wiley in Colorado and Denver and Eric Arenberg who uh, works very closely with Lance in Florida. So that's our team, and we're privileged to be working with two really illustrious groups. With that, Lance, I'll let you uh, take us through what we're actually going to do, PRBs for flux. All right, so the, the ESTCP project is trying to gain flux measurements with horizontal tools, and so uh, they see this as a underutilized uh, tool in the industry to monitor flux and really understand what's going on as far as flux because it helps us tremendously with what the treatments are doing, especially with PRVs, uh, but also, you know, decision points on risk management and how to, how to better understand that. And so 
Um, we're trying to expand the scope of that uh, through different things, uh, but mainly we're focusing on some of the PFAS uh, constituents uh, in this study. And so that's, that's actually, um, it's gonna be applicable to all the other contaminant uh, type of um, mass and flux, but we're focused on that one for this study. Uh, this is actually, um, there's a graph here, but basically if we understand the discharge rate from a zone, we can, we can more adequately understand how long a treatment or a zone is going to take uh, to clean up. And so the, the flux out of that zone is really critical to, to all that understanding. The primary objective for this study is to, to use vertebrae, a, high, a horizontal tool to measure, measure flux. So we've previously uh, been doing this at sites, uh, Arcadis especially, with vertical tools measuring flux, but we're trying to adapt those and apply those in a horizontal method. Now, the first thought would be, um, you know, vertical is maybe the standard for how to measure flux, but that may not be true. What we're trying to find out is horizontal actually may be a much better tool to, to measure flux. And so these are some of the questions we're trying to answer. And then uh, we're gonna, so we're gonna compare those to the vertical transects with horizontal transects. We're also gonna have um, long sect and try to develop the flux going down the spine of the plume uh, with a singular well. And so that'll be an interesting part of the study as well. And then of course, with all that information, we're gonna try to develop some of the guidance documents and some of the cost uh, considerations and design considerations for future work using uh, these tools. Uh, this kind of shows you a representation of what we're talking about on a particular plume that was uh, one of the sites we were comparing. Uh, it actually wasn't the site selected for this study, but the, uh, you can see how we want to transect this, the plume in the, the picture there and then a long set going down kind of uh, one of the transport pathways to see what is really taking place. And then uh, we're trying to evaluate a couple different things in that zone. Uh, redox uh, is one of those and the flux. So we're going to be studying that. Uh, and then we're going to be using mainly three different methods for flux measurement. Uh, the typical uh, washout and point dilution test where we see the, the dilution from a slug uh, out of a well. So we'll, we'll measure that out of a vertebrae segment. We're going to uh, measure kind of a pu push-pull type of technique uh, for flux measurement with, with dye tracers and different things like that to measure what they call the shut-in period. And then the I guess the most exciting one is, is uh, using an active distributing uh, a distributed temperature sensing technology, ADTS, which uses a fiber optic temperature uh, probe. And they, this is the vertical layout for it. Uh, what they do is measure heat transfer as a, and compare it as a function of uh, fluid transfer. And so they're able to give you an output of your, your high K and your low K zones using this sensor. Now, this will be the first time it's being deployed in a horizontal plane. So this will be a very interesting part of the, the uh, study. And then to kind of wrap this up, so we're studying uh, PFOS. We're trying to use this at an Air Force site to measure flux. And hopefully we'll be able to implement this and implement some documentation to show how it can be utilized in a lot of different ways. Uh, knowing that the, the crux of the whole flux measurement is figuring out how sites kind of bleed out and how we can best tackle cleaning them up um, or letting them resolve themselves uh, by understanding flux better. And lastly, I didn't mention this, but our wells are PFOS free. Uh, we can certify that per project uh, so they can be used for that type of site. And just to kind of wrap that up and then pass it off to Tim, uh, there's a couple other things. I, I mentioned the PRBs, we are using them for that. There's some expanding territories where vertebrae can be used for landfills and different sediment interfaces. And so that is where I think Tim takes over. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. All right, thank you very much, Lance. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll be presenting is how we built a probabilistic model to estimate the value or the savings associated with a vertebrae system versus vertical wells. 
So the model has um, several goals. One was to estimate the cost of a pr proposed vertebrae well system. And we based that on some actual well installations and some linear regression techniques. The other one is to estimate the cost of the vertical well system needed to achieve the same performance as the vertebrae system based on what we refer to as the vertical to horizontal ratio. This vertical to horizontal ratio is based on uh, research and work done by uh, Richard Layton, a PhD, and uh, his work in publication and remediation in 2019. But it gives us a set of equations to be able to say how many vertical wells would you need to get the same performance as the vertebrae system. And we're, then we're estimating the savings associated with that, the difference between those two systems. Now, what's really happening is that the, the model is saying you would need seven or eight or 10, 11 vertical wells to replace this horizontal system. Um, and it's not saying you would actually install those wells, but it's saying this system is performing as if it is that many, that many vertical wells. The analogy I like to use, it's like if you went out and decided to buy an old Volkswagen Beetle and found out that it was performing like a Ferrari. And the, the, the difference between the cost of the new Ferrari and the, and the Volkswagen Beetle would be the savings or the performance savings that you're getting. Um, so if we move on, Lance has already talked about some of the real features and benefits of the vertebrae system, those being the high contact area and the capitalizing on the the horizontal to vertical permeability ratios, the larger area influence at lower flow rates. So these are all features in general, the first three of horizontal wells, but the next two to be able to, to address the problem on the preferential pass and allow for independent operation. That's what gives you that additional performance, but actually all five of these factors working together give you that enhanced performance over the vertical wells. Um, the way the model works is we have a linear regression that was done based on actual installations of the vertebrae system. So it, the, the determining factors are the length of the well bores you might expect, the, the number of vertebrae systems or the segmented horizontal wells that are in there for each well bore. Um, and th those type of things are driving the, the vertebrae cost. The horizontal cost is determined by well, the the vertical to horizontal ratio, we're saying how many vertical wells would we need? Um, and then we're using uh, Monte Carlo simulation. We have input probability distributions based on research on costs for things like drilling, casing, well screen, trenching, all those factors go into the model to estimate the cost of the vertical well system. This is just an example of an input sheet for the system. Um, includes everything from the subsurface conditions, the soil type, the hydraulic conductivity, the depth of groundwater, the depth of the base of the aquifer, factors related to the um, any vertical well system. If there's a planned in system that's planned to be installed, we can use that and estimate the cost comparison between the proposed vertebrae system and the planned vertical well. Or as we said, we can just go ahead and base it off the vertical to horizontal ratio. And then we also have in the purpose, you know, is it for injection or treatment, horizontal wells? Um, are the wells being installed parallel as some of the ways that uh, Lance showed you that these designs can be put in place, the length of the well bores. So all that goes in is input information into the model. And the output looks something like this. This first on the right hand side, we're looking at two probability distribution functions as well as the mean of those functions. So what we're saying here is for the vertebrae system that's planned to be installed at the site, it costs approximately $100,000 to get it drilled and installed. On the other hand, uh, to put an equivalent system, vertical system in place, it would cost on the order of $220,000, and there's a lot more uncertainty. This distribution, this, this, this range here is saying you could spend as much as $300,000 or more to get in that vertical system. So you're getting considerable savings, and remember, you're getting – additional performance. Uh, one of the things that I've seen from these models and will, will come up when I start presenting the inputs and the, how sensitive it is to the input, but in general, the vertical well is gonna perform at least as well or way outperform, excuse me, the vertebrae wells are gonna perform as well or way outperform the vertical wells. And in general, it's gonna cost a lot less. I mean, that's the basic feature of, of how this is all coming together. So 
Now, there are a number of factors that really drive the performance, and that performance, again, is based on that vertical to horizontal ratio. Uh, things like the hydraulic conductivity, the flow rate that you're planning on pulling or, or distributing the treatment, um, screen lengths, and the drawdown level if you're trying to draw it down. Now, there's an inverse correlation for hydraulic conductivity. This is called a sensitivity tornado diagram. And what it's showing is that as hydraulic conductivity goes up, so this is high inputs on this side, it's not coming up real clear, but generally it's an inverse correlation. As your hydraulic conductivity increases, your vertical to horizontal ratio goes down. In other words, if you had a pure sand, something very, very clean, well, horizontal is going to work almost the same as a vertical. However, if you've got tighter soil, if you've got clays, you've got silts, or you've got a mixture of that, the tighter that's getting, the lower the hydraulic conductivity, the higher your ratio of vertical to horizontal. Um, so that's just one factor. Other factors like the flow rate, the screen length, and the drawdown, they're directly correlated. These are just what inputs into the model. And again, this is based on the work of Richard Layton and the equations that he's developed. What, so knowing that, um, to delve a little deeper into the sensitivity to hydraulic conductivity, this is just showing a distribution like if I'm told that there's a clay sand at the site. Well, the clay sand, even within itself, has a lot of heterogeneity. It can, it can go down to a very low hydraulic conductivity. Well, it's low across the board actually, but even much lower. So at 0.59 gallons per day per foot square to about 11 or so gallons per day. And what this is showing us here is if, if the model is finding or the soil actually is lower towards the lower end, you're gonna have a much higher vertical to horizontal. So it's gonna be seven to one here. If you're on this end of the distribution, if you're on the high end of the distribution, then two to one. But it shows you just how sensitive it is just to that one clay sand. That most of our sites don't just have clay sand. They have clays and they have silts. Uh, they can have fill. They have a, lo a wide range of things in place. And that, and knowing that and knowing that the sensitivity to hydraulic conductivity shows you why um, the horizontal will far outperform the vertical. This is just an example where I'm doing uh, an uncertainty across just hydraulic conductivity. If I hold the, the hydro, hydraulic conductivity at a set value, at a set mean value, I think it go, I think it was 0.5 or so, or five along that range of gallons per day per foot squared. Then the mean difference is 100,000 for the vertebrae system versus 277,000 for vertical wells. But look at all this uncertainty in cost or what you'd have to spend to get equivalent performance. And that's just because of the uncertainty in the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, we're just giving you a suite of statistics here, but the savings could be, as, you know, on the range of 176,000 to as much as, again, based in performance, $369,000 in terms of the value that you're getting out of the system. Um, this is just some recent case studies, some actual examples of the cost of the vertebrae system uh, the total cost here, this includes both um, the system installation cost and the drilling of the bores, you know, so this is the cost of the sleeve and the setup of the vertebrae with uh, pulling in that conduit, creating it, and this is the drilling. But at any rate, uh, the total cost at a particular site, and this, this model predicted very ac accurately to the actual cost, about $133,000. The ratio on average was four to four to one, so it means that at this site, by the way, they had 18, as, as Lance has shown you, some of the sites have many different, uh, many screened intervals within each well. Uh, it seems like we've lost the, um, the presentation. Are y'all still seeing the presentation? Uh, there it is, coming back. All right, so here it is. Uh, there's 18 actual well segments of plan to go in with a, a vertical to horizontal four to one, it'd actually take 72 wells. And I'm not saying you're gonna install 72 vertical wells. I'm saying that the system is performing as if it is 72 wells and because it's giving you that much performance. It's giving you um, some $200,000 in value. You can either call it savings or you can think of it as I'm getting this increased performance and it's why I can clean up the site a lot quicker as Lance has shown you within four quarters, the site's becoming cleaner. This is just showing you the relative savings between these three case studies, a 
76%, 73%. So that's how much savings you're getting, or you could think of it as increased performance. So this is just an example of what we're doing with the model. We've been working on it, and um, actually we keep improving it over time, but it is predicting very good results, and it just shows you the savings you get. And like again, like I like to say is that this horizontal system at minimum is going to be performed similar to a vertical, uh, but most likely way outperform it and do it at less cost. And uh, so just some summary caveats. Uh, the model approximates savings associated with a vert vertebrae well system when competing with vertical wells, vertebrae versus vertical. I know it gets a little confusing because they both have a V in there, but the vertebrae well system when competing with vertical well system. The equations for calculating the vertical horizontal ratio are very sensitive. And I mean, they are very sensitive to a number of factors. The primary one being hydraulic conductivity. Um, the model does not simulate groundwater flow or calculated zones of influence using the groundwater flow equation or finite, finite element methods. It's just not that sophisticated. It's to give you a quick look at the, at the economics and the savings there. It's something we're considering building into it in the future. Um, it does not include operating costs. And actually, when we include operating costs, I think the value of the vertebrae system is going to be shown all that much more effective because you run the vertebrae system for less time because of the performance that you're getting out of it. Um, the final design and operating operation of the vertebrae system does require additional engineering of the type that Lance does and what he was showing you before. So the final design is not based on an economic model, though the economic model can be used to compare the final design to perhaps a plan design that was, was being considered before the, uh, the, the vertical model was considered. But, um, you know, still the final design, there's the engineering that goes into that and that the model does not do that. Um, I was actually at the end of my slide presentation. It seems like the presentation is gone, but uh, I was at the end anyway. I don't know if there might be some slides, Steve. I think you're coming up at the end, but that's all I have for my portion of the talk. And um, I'll go ahead and advance one. It looks like Steve's coming up and uh, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, well, that's Lance's uh completing the presentation. I have just a couple of comments before we take questions. Lance, do you want to uh, wrap it up here? Sure, if I could uh, just add on to what Tim was saying is the the model's great at telling us how many wells we believe we would need in a single bore to have maximum effectiveness. And there's kind of this, this zone in between where we're providing much more control than any traditional layout and plenty of uh, plenty of robustness to treat the site effectively and quickly. And so it becomes a, a matter in, in my perspective of economics and what's cost effective on each site. And certainly in so many cases, we're providing uh, more than what the client really uh, required uh, to get it clean and, and actually, uh, you know, take one step further and clean things up that much faster. Um, to recap though, uh, we see this as a huge, uh, a huge benefit, the assessment part of this. I don't know how many sites where we have clients that said, hey, let's use this for remediation. We say, that's great, that's great, please sample them. Um, because inevitably they get out there, they sample these and they find out there's something they didn't know. And so that's a huge part of this, not just from the higher resolution uh, point of view, but just from uh, filling in a more complete picture of the site is a huge benefit. And then uh, when you use these for remediation, we're, we're providing a better, more efficient design and we're able to dynamically adjust, which is really what sets us apart from those traditional horizontal wells and put us head, of, um, head over heels there on that. So with that, I'd like to pass it back off and uh, I guess open it for questions. Um, okay. Yeah, this, is, this was great, yeah. Thanks. Lance, do you, have, do you have our closing slide with our contact info in there? I think that's next. Yep, there it is. Yeah, if you can leave that up, that would be great. Um, and then yeah. I um, I neglected to uh, give the 60-second overview of Steve's long and illustrious career, so I'll do that real quick. He's oh, the president yeah. of the uh, EN, and he's the uh, is a, has experience in the environmental industry. Um, for over three decades, he's recognized for development and application of innovative remediation protocols. He has 175 technical articles, so I don't know when he sleeps, four books and four international patents. He co-founded Regenesis in 1994, 
and uh, has moved into a senior consulting position. He's recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Award from AEHS and a WSJ Technology Development Award. He's been an adjunct professor for 35 years at different universities, and he is a PhD MS uh, from Cornell University. So I, I know you're not <laughs> tooting your own horn, so I thought I'll do that quick. Well, okay, you're, of, you're embarrassing me. Okay, if I have all those publications, I'm almost 70, so I've had a little more time <laughs> than most people. Yeah. Um, I did want to just uh, take a few minutes uh, expanding on what we're very proud of in terms of the model. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll run that for you if you're interested at no charge. We need to sign NDAs for uh, that type of thing. Uh, we're happy to do that. Uh, but we have some conclusions, and uh, I think uh, uh, Tim uh, covered that very well. Uh, we've been able to run the model on cases. Here, here's my take. Uh, if you're in a wide open field, we can't compete with that. When you start to get into more infrastructural adjustments, trenching and stuff, that's where we start to get a leg up. And then we have no competition for access, which was a point made earlier, of course. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, unless you could get in a building and do vertical, uh, that's a huge advantage for the horizontal system. Uh, looking at that Kona depression slide, it uh, reminded me of something that's on my drawing board. If we ever get to it, <clears throat> there could be a role for horizontal wells and dewatering. Uh, that I'll leave that as a uh, uh, just as a statement for you to consider. <clears throat> now, if you want, as a final point, uh, or two final points, if you want to get into the really deep technical weeds with Dr. Layton, who, by the way, is a, a professor of geology, where I'm an adjunct at Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton, uh, his publications in peer-reviewed literature, and Tim has an excellent summary on his uh, uh, approaches, is is on our website easy to find. And uh, I will point out um, those actual results that uh, uh, those three examples, that's for small sites. Those are all effectively gas stations. We do a lot of gas station dry cleaner work. Uh, how the company's been around since 2001 actually uh, uh, really has laid its foundation. We're trying to get into the larger uh, projects. And as you get into a larger project, obviously some of those uh, uh, cost savings will increase. So I just wanted to put my two cents in on that. And uh, Lance, uh, okay, so if you need anything, Lance and I are at your service. And so uh, Jane, it's back over to you for any uh, any questions great. that might be yeah, put we out. Got some, we got some great questions. The first one is from um, Thomas Weiberg. How do you install the filter pack and how can you redevelop the walls if needed? So there, uh, there actually isn't a filter pack. We use a geotextile uh, and wrap the wells. And the, unfortunately, filter packs get so heavy that they're hard to work with. Uh, we actually can install filter packs, but it just it's never an advantage. The wells outperform uh, vertically any other type of well, and we can use fine enough screens to, uh, to clear the, the water up uh, if that's the issue there. And to redevelop them, we use uh, pretty standard techniques. We'll blow air into them or, or put some type of, um, you know, aqua clear or something like that to redevelop a well and pump on them or reverse flow on them. And, you know, the back and forth method to get them to clear up if that's needed. Okay. And then the next question was from Stan White. Once the project is complete, how do you abandon the wells? So by typical practice, if if it uh, is a large enough well, like some of our SVE wells are large enough, we could install a trimmy pipe to make sure the grout gets all the way to the end. Uh, but in most cases, the, the tubing is small enough, we, we're certain by volume that we filled them. And so we grout them up just like you typically would. There's some, uh, there's some significant advantages to horizontal wells as far as abandonment, namely uh, the fact that there's usually only one or two penetrations through the overburden and you're actually not connecting aquifers to each other, which is the main purpose for abandonment as far as you know, making sure future releases don't take those pathways. So there's a, a few great things to point out from an abandonment uh, standpoint um, that we'd love to, I don't think we have time to go through all of those, but um, they're, they're key benefits to showing that abandonment's actually better using horizontal wells than vertical wells. 
Okay, great. And then um, from Nick Hosel, we have, in your experience, have you seen nested horizontal well technology used to overcome water level fluctuations in multi-phase extraction? For example, could different sections of a horizontal well be cycled on off based on if that section of well screen is in LNAPL slash groundwater interface? Uh, yes and no. I, I we've, we've seen a little bit of it, but they haven't been sites. They've been smaller sites where there haven't been multiple layers of it, but your premise is perfect and you can do that. So you you can have multiple layers of them and you can get them at just the right depth so that you have the maximum amount of extraction and get, if you're trying to get a floating uh, phase product, uh, you, you're going to be much more efficient in the horizontal plane to capture that because instead of, you know, like a two inch well or a four inch well, you now have, you know, hundreds of inches of capture. And so they're much more efficient in a, uh, horizontal sense for capture like that. Okay. And then the next one was from David McCarley. Can you achieve the same results with packers instead of grout? All right. So um, I'm not sure if we mean internally or externally here in the question. Um, if we use packers in the bore, um, we, we couldn't pull them back out because uh, there's all kinds of native sand collapse or native formation collapse. And so uh, we also know that in sections where uh, traditional horizontal wells use packers, their main detriment is the fact that even if you packer the well screen zone, uh, flow is going to get outside of that in the borehole between the well screen and the bore. So they don't have an external grout, which is why uh, the packers inside don't aren't even that effective. So um, I don't know that you could achieve the same result uh, from packers for those reasons. I also know the grout, we mix it up thin so that it has some permeation into the, the uh, native material also. So uh, there's a number of reasons I think grout would outperform some type of packer setup. Okay, and then our next question was from Gary Engel. Uh, when he was in with NAFAC Pacific years ago, they did a mile of horizontal directional drilling from roughly Aloha Stadium in Hawaii underwater to Pearl Harbor's Ford Island. Different use, it was for electrical upgrade, but very successful. How long a distance have you seen a drill run going? All right, so the longest one we've done so far is uh, 972 feet to install a well. Uh, we can probably, with our systems using the sleeve, that's really our limitation, which is typically about 1,200 feet, uh, depending upon what size sleeve we're using. And then what we see as far as there's there's an economic trade-off, though. When you start getting to those kind of distances, your pressure losses inside the risers really start to take over on the economics. And so a lot of times if I see you know, a 3,000-foot plume, I don't think I would ever try to actually install all 3,000 feet of it in a single uh, installation because of all the pressure losses for the device itself. And so it wouldn't be a, a question of whether we can drill that far. It would be more of an application. What's the best way to cover this entire area? Is it with four well systems or six well systems or two well systems? And so it, it's. Um, I know the drillers can drill much further than that but it becomes kind of how, how long can the device go? Okay, and then we have from Michael Hanna, how effective is the nested horizontal well system for removing heavier l apples such as NSFO? Um, I'm, you know, I don't think we've pulled that in yet. And uh, if we can, a lot of times we like to, you know, use a surfactant to break some of the viscosity and increase recovery, but that would be an interesting thing to pilot. We we strongly believe in piloting a lot of things before we go full scale on it, and that would definitely be one of them. Okay, and I think that was every question. Um, and then we got a thank you from Stan White, which is nice. Um, oh, yeah. Jane, uh, do we have another minute here? When, when are yes. you cutting off? Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, the, uh, the question about the grout uh, triggered a thought I want to share. So um, what is the integrity of the grout? 
and uh, we've got good news there. We had for many years, and you saw one example in the first case study Lance showed, it's, uh, it's inferred that it's really good because you don't see homogenization of measurements between segments. There can be something very high and something very low 10 feet apart. So that's prima facie evidence for that. However, in the last couple of years, we've been associated with Estus, A-E-S-T-U-S. -E uh, they do what I call and others call enviro tomography. Uh, they use electrical resistance to uh, image the subsurface, and it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, so uh, Todd Hallahan, who's a CTO but also a professor at Oklahoma State, uh, uh, is uh, worked on a site here in California. Uh, it was just fortuitous. Uh, he was doing it. Uh, he was on the separate contract to study the site, and we've captured that data. We're going to be doing more of the same thing. But on our website, we have a presentation by Todd Hallahan. Uh, frankly, it needs to be narrated because it's frankly a little bit confusing. The point is we have visual evidence that our grout is really uh, maintains its integrity. And um, so we're very pleased that we have that, uh, that visual in addition to the uh, inferred uh, performance. And a uh, little bit of a secret comment here is uh, Lance and I, we've been developing a more flexible grout with certain additives, food safe additives, because grout's cracked. And, uh, you know, we're wondering what the possibilities are for all grouting uh, if we uh, bring that home. But we're a small company, there's only so many things we could do. Uh, but uh, we're, we're very pleased with the performance of the grout uh, based on those two uh, lines of evidence. And um, also, Jane, would you, you were so kind uh, sharing my background, could you take a minute to uh, uh, share with the people the, the distinguished background of my colleagues, Tim and Lance? Do you have that in front of you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Lance is a P and is the chief technology officer of the company. He co-developed and patented the vertebrae well system and the NRX uh, support package technologies. Um, during his nine year tenure with the company. Prior to this, uh, he worked for nine years as a design and assessment engineer for various environmental consultants in the remediation industry. His experience spans projects in petroleum, pesticides, and solvent remediation, completing projects from inception through closure. He graduated from the University of South Florida with a BS in chemical engineering. And then Timothy Abernack is the managing principal of Optima Analytics. He has over 35 years of experience providing strategic planning, project management, and management consulting services to the environmental remediation, natural resources, manufacturing industries, and oil and gas industries. He specializes in the application of multi-criteria decision analysis, financial risk assessment, probabilistic modeling, and project controls for a wide range of projects, including remediation, restoration, decommissioning, and alternative energy projects. He's a certified project management professional, PMP, and author of the book, Modern Project Management Techniques for the Environmental Remediation Industry. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Petroleum Engineering from Marietta College and has an MBA from Carnegie Mellon. So very impressive bios, guys. And this was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and um, and I know the the PDF of the um, uh, for the PDH is attached, and also the presentation. And if you want to share this with other colleagues, it will be available on the COI website. So um, we encourage you to do that also. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and we appreciate our audience's attention, and we're here to serve you, help you every way we can. Great. Uh, I, just, I just want to close out with one last thing. Uh, we do have our 2021 Virtual Capital Week happening, March 22nd through the 26th. Um, it is a member-only event, but you can sign up to be a member with SAME today. Uh, just visit the website at samecapweek.org, and you'll get all the information you need. Uh, we're offering virtual exhibit hall, different um, chiefs, pan, uh, executive panels, and um, different briefings on the different agencies. So 
make sure you check out that website. Thank you guys again for an excellent presentation. It was well informative. And make sure you download the, today's handouts, the PDH certificate, and the PDF version of today's presentation. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, my God.